episode 39 of the podcast. This week, we're going to discuss what it means to have a behavior reinforced. What exactly is reinforcement? In the next part, we're going to talk about what makes a reward. You're listening to the Creating Great Grooming Dogs podcast. I'm Chrissy Neumeyer-Smith. I'm a certified professional groomer, certified behavior consultant for canines, certified professional dog trainer, and the owner of Happy Critters in Nashua, New Hampshire. And this, my friends and colleagues, is where grooming and training meet. I'm starting with an example this week. So if a dog does something that you liked and you give them a treat, did you just reinforce that behavior? Hmm. Yeah, let's ponder that for a moment. Did you just reinforce it? You liked something, you gave them a treat. I want you to think that um, many of us have a very simplified view of if you liked it and you give them something good fast as possible. It's almost like if we if we jam a treat in, it won't leak out of their head, <laughs> right? But is it that simple? Yes and no. And um, that's clear as mud, right? (laughs) So let's get into some details. When trainers are talking about reinforcement, we're talking about reinforcing the target behavior. So that means the exact and precise behavior that we want to see increase in frequency or duration. So that increase is how often it happens and how long it can happen is what we're referring to as reinforcement. The example I gave of if you liked it and you gave it a treat doesn't give us enough information about if the behavior has increased, decreased, or remained the same in the next few minutes or on the long term. So reinforcement is a little bit trickier than just I gave them something, so therefore it must have been reinforced. So sometimes the dog doesn't link the treat or reward, your attempt to reward, with the action that they just did, the behavior that you liked. Sometimes a cookie is just a cookie. Sometimes a cookie is a distraction. Sometimes the dog is just not going to take the cookie, right? Um, Sometimes the reward that you chose isn't something that this dog is interested in at that moment. Uh, Many dogs on a grooming table aren't interested in treats. And not every dog is interested in treats in general. So part of the solution is to find a way to link the dog's actions that you liked to the I'm going to reward that, please do it more often. (laughs) right? So that's done by adding a reward marker. Now, a reward marker is a way to communicate, that was it, now here's something pleasant. Something pleasant. We'll talk more about rewards in the next part, but something pleasant is what we're doing as a reward, and it's individual, and it's in context. Or the reward marker might mean you're doing great, keep doing that, that was it, now here's something pleasant. So let's talk about some of these different reward markers that are pretty common. Well, the first one is a clicker. Now, clicker training is using the click sound to mark a moment in time and is linked to a food treat. So you start off by teaching click, treat, click, treat, click, treat. So the dog starts feeling like I heard the sound, my mouth waters, thinking there's a treat about to enter my mouth. (laughs) It's a great tool. (coughs) Excuse me. It's a great tool. And um, one of the ways that you can use that is to be thinking about the exact thing that you want. Click, give a treat. Click, give a treat. The downside to using clickers is that um, many dogs won't take a treat on a grooming table. And clickers are really based on teaching the beginning things with treats. You're not going to need to use a clicker and treats forever for a dog who is learning. But while they are learning, that's the contract a clicker creates. The clicker means, you know, they hear click, click, and they get a treat. That's what it means, and we don't want to mess with that. <laughs> but the advantage to a clicker is that um, many owners are already using clickers. So you might have a dog on your table who understands that already. And if you have a dog who is motivated by food in that moment, in that context, with that level of distraction and difficulty of a grooming shop, <laughs> right, then using a clicker might be helpful. Now, we've talked about clickers before a little bit, but um, part of the issue is that it is very hard to be working with a dog with two hands. Um, We often have like a hand on their body and a hand on the tool that's going over their body and to try to click while we're doing that is, is needs a third hand. But there are clickers with a raised button. And um, if you teach yourself how to do that with your foot, <laughs> you can press the button with your foot, click, click, 
joking. Um, that can be really helpful. So um, tell you what, I'll try to I'll try to come up with a video for that for you guys. But I want you to think about um, having somebody else click for you. Mm, it, it's a little bit tricky because the person holding the dog and working with the dog is the only one who really knows if that dog feels loose. If that dog is cooperating, if that dog feels calm, right? The person who is holding the clicker might just be seeing a happy face, but that dog might still be kind of pulling against our, our hand, right? Um, and pulling against our hand doesn't necessarily mean angry. Like, that could be a happy thing, but we still need them to be calm in our hands. So it's a tough one. You really need someone very, very skilled that you can partner up with to, if they're going to be using a clicker while you groom. Um, however, then you also have the dogs that won't take a treat on a table and a clicker told them you did it right, but they're not getting a reward. So we don't necessarily want that happening. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> so another way to just use a reward marker is you can use something that the owners probably use at home, which is good. But I'm going to say in episode 23, I covered, um, I gave two common training words to avoid, good and no. And there are a number of reasons why good might not be a great option for the grooming table. So I did a whole episode on those. So you can go back and listen to episode 23 if you'd like. But good often in, in the context that's used at home means you're done. Right? So if you keep saying a dog is good and then continue you're kind of breaking the contract that they're used to at home. You can build some real frustration that way. They're like, you haven't let me down yet. Yeah, you said good, and I'm ready to go out and play. You know, so good isn't necessarily a great one. Now, I'm a SATS trainer. That's Sinalia Training Systems. That's Casey Cover's information stuff. <laughs> Sorry, Casey, <laughs> information stuff. Uh, but so we use different reward markers. There's a terminal bridge, the... This is the moment you did something correct, ta-da, you get something, right? You, or you, something pleasant happens for you. Um, then there's also the intermediate bridge, which is continue what you're doing. This behavior is all rewardable. That's it, you're done. Now we can give you something pleasant or do something pleasant. So the sounds that I teach my training customers are D and D, 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 D. Right. So it's weird to say it's not normal for a dog and it's not normal for us, but it also doesn't sound like words that they hear all the time. Right. It should be a very mechanical sound. So if I'm working with a dog and I have them on my table and I want to indicate to them that they're holding their foot very well. Right. Um, perhaps I'm trying to clip a poodle foot. Right. Trying to shave feet and the, they're doing really well. And I say, and let go and give them a cookie or pet them on the head. The other thing about the SATS training is that it has not been linked only to treats. It means reward. It means something pleasant is going to happen. It's a little bit different, but it is still definitely motivating, right? The animals that learn this are like, oh, I heard a sound and I know that sound means good things for me. <laughs> and that's what the reward marker should be. Good things are going to happen. Maybe not fantastic things. Maybe you're not going home right now, but we're still working, but good things are going to happen. So I use the sound D. Now, the other sound, that D, 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 means keep doing what you're doing. You are not yet completed. Um, so if I'm holding that same foot and maybe that dog is being great and relaxed into my hand while I'm shaving in that poodle foot, which, by the way, trainers, be thinking about that. Like, we, we actually get in between their toes with clippers and meticulously shave out poodle feet, <laughs> right? This is not a short behavior. It's a duration behavior. Um, and then we do four of them. We do all four feet. So while they are being good, I can be telling them, D -d 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 right? That means continue what you're doing. My God, you're the best dog in the whole wide world. And that's a pretty powerful message. And a lot of dogs, when they start understanding that sound, start relaxing into it. Like, ah, oh, this is what I'm doing. Um, and there are lots of ways to use these sounds. Um, it doesn't always mean to be calm. It doesn't always mean anything. It just means you're doing great in this context. I like this. 
it's going to lead to something pleasant. <laughs> and that's a very oversimplified view too. Um, but the ways to use those are to be thinking about, all right, well, I've got to teach the dog while something else is going on because I don't want to just start that when something unpleasant is happening or something that they perceive as unpleasant or scary or overwhelming, right? So I might start off with just petting a dog, right? So you might pet the dog and get them used to like, okay, I'm going to touch your shoulder. Dee. Good job. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to touch your shoulder again. Dee, 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 dee. Good job. Right? Something that they don't worry about. And you might pair it with cookies. But again, the complexities of a grooming setting, and this is important for the trainers, the complexities of a grooming setting are that many dogs won't take a treat in that setting because that setting is overwhelming. It's not necessarily the grooming process that's overwhelming, but they've been loaded in a car, dropped off someplace in a room full of other dogs and people that they may or may not know very well, right? This commotion, this is a very weird day for them. And for many dogs, even just leaving the house has already added a level of stress. So it's not necessarily the groomer's fault that this dog is stressed. This is what most groomers are working with and the context that we have. So I usually see it as a big win if I can get a dog to take a cookie from me in grooming setting. Like, okay, great. Awesome. This dog is not really stressed out because <laughs> you'd be surprised. I've had owners be shocked when they're like, oh, of course he'll take it. I'm like, nope. Your dog's not interested in that right now. So we need to find rewards that this dog is motivated by what this dog is going to think is pleasant. And in the next part, we're going to talk about what makes a reward. If you're enjoying my podcast, please remember to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. What makes a reward? So part of our solution, right, to helping a dog find the link between the behavior that they are doing and that this is pleasant and rewardable, right, is that we need a good reward. And we need to think about the dog in front of us in this moment and figure out what that dog will find rewarding or pleasant in this context. And pleasant is different than treat, right? I want you to be thinking about rewards as something pleasant. It might be a treat. It might be a toy. It might be getting to take a break right? To, to restore pleasant from something that they thought was, was scary. Um, so what is pleasant? <laughs> that's a tricky one. And that's for every different dog, right? Each dog is an individual. What is pleasant? What is motivating? That's a good one, right? What is this dog willing to work for? What is this dog going to be thinking is interesting? Um, what can compete with this distraction level or this difficulty level? Because a dog that usually finds one type of reward very rewarding may be way overwhelmed. <laughs> I know, tech talk, way overwhelmed. Um, but maybe too overwhelmed to find that motivating in this moment. Uh, I will give you an example. One of my dogs um, likes to tug, but in fly ball, he's too overstimulated to care about tugging. So it's a big win that I've got him tugging on the ball that he brings back. It's a very overstimulating, exciting, overwhelming, awesome feeling that he has that he just doesn't have the focus to be taking a tug toy. So even though he's enjoying himself, <laughs> I need a way to have him interact with me at the end, right? So that's part of our reward. But I actually like put my hand in his mouth and I'm tugging on that ball and actually loop my fingers behind his canine teeth so that he doesn't clamp down on my fingers. <laughs> it's a little bit like just pulling on a dog's mouth. It looks like I'm getting bit. It's hilarious. Um, all right. Unless you think it's not and you think I'm a dog abuser, <laughs> but um, it's motivating for him in that moment. Whereas at home, he thinks tug toys are awesome. I have seen labs not take treats on a grooming table right? And we all think of labs as like, of course, he's going to take a treat. Mm, no, no, he, I, he didn't take it. You know, so we need to figure out what will be pleasant at that time. And here's where rewards and reinforcement get a little tricky. I want you to think about um, positive reinforcement means something added to increase the likelihood of that behavior occurring. Negative reinforcement means something removed that will increase the, the amount of behavior that we see. 
right, that will increase that behavior, that will keep it going. So something added is positive reinforcement, like the math positive added. Something removed is negative reinforcement, removed, negative, right, kind of algebraic. There's also positive punishment and negative punishment, and we will do another whole podcast on those. But this is very, very basic. So when we think about positive reinforcement, that's when we're trying to find a reward to give, something to do for the dog. Like your behavior was something I liked. I'm going to mark it with a reward marker of some sort, and I'm going to apply, add, (laughs) give something pleasant in hopes that that behavior will happen more often. And the science usually shows that it does. So (laughs) if we are thinking about it has to be pleasant at this moment, if you give a dog a cookie who isn't interested in cookies, in that moment, sometimes dogs will start to lighten up a little bit because they're seeing that you're trying to give them something. And I know that's anthropomorphic. I can't really get in their head and understand what they're thinking. But for many dogs, the attempt to give them a cookie, even if they're stressed out, can sometimes bridge the gap. They're like, I don't know if I'm interested in a cookie right now. But there is sort of this idea in their head like, well, she's trying to be nice. I know that's very anthropomorphic. I know I'm attributing thoughts to dogs that I can't get into their head. However, I have seen time and again that they start to loosen up. We've, We've tried to be pleasant. And they start to understand like, oh, all right, I'm coming around. (laughs) So it's still worth trying if you think that using treats in your shop setting is safe. And we've talked about that in other episodes. Also, treats aren't necessarily a good idea in a grooming setting. So if we are doing something pleasant, we also have negative reinforcement. And negative reinforcement is when you remove something to increase the behavior that just happened. I'm going to give you an example. Now, I'm going to say this is, I'm actually counteracting something I said in a previous podcast about negative reinforcement and we don't really use it because I wasn't really thinking about how we use it every day. Negative reinforcement has a bad reputation because it sounds like we have to apply something awful and then remove it for, for it to be pleasant. Here's the thing. We are doing something that this dog is a little bit stressed about. And if the reward is, I'm going to restore pleasant, right? So we can remove the thing that they thought was was a little bit hard, a little bit difficult, remove that, restore pleasant. That's actually negative reinforcement. So I was shaving a poodle's feet. (laughs) <laughs> which is pretty common, kind of a thing that dogs are like, oh, they get twitchy, um, they're pulling away. And he was trying to pull away, and I'm relaxing his foot. And I only end when his foot's relaxed. Even if I'm finished, this is a really important one for you groomers, even if I finished and he's struggling a little bit, that last moment of like, okay, good, and I'm done. We don't want to release on that. Good, fine, yank it now, I, I finished it. Relaxing his foot. Relax in his foot. When he is relaxed, reward marker, release. Because I'm ending the holding of his foot while the behavior that I was looking for was to be holding his foot nicely, right? There wasn't tension. I had it in my head that I wanted a foot that was just relaxed into my hand, right? And then I'm just relaxing that foot, maybe relaxing it with the clippers up against his foot, relaxing it while I put it in between his toes. And instead of just going for it, groomers listen, instead of just going for it and continuing and picking because he's so still, releasing it anyway because he was so still. And we're building still, hey, holding my foot still, means she might let go. I don't struggle for her to let go. She lets go when I'm still. That's negative reinforcement. And it has a bad reputation for being cruel, <laughs> but I think it's because um, in normal dog training context, we would have to be doing something unpleasant, which always seems mean. And I think that uh, it's really okay for the grooming context because grooming tends to be something that if a dog is having issues with it, it's because they find it unpleasant, right? 
There, there are things that we have to do that dogs aren't necessarily interested in having done to them. Sometimes it's just a matter of like, oh, come on. I don't want to be on a table for a while, right? They're like squirmy little kids. They don't want to do it, right? But to stop and give them a break means that we have restored pleasant. It doesn't necessarily mean that we stopped beating the dog, <laughs> right? That's not what we're doing. We're not beating the dog. We're, we're restoring pleasant because it's in our power to do that in that moment. Now, I wasn't really even aware that that's exactly what I was doing. So, all right, I know, bad on me because I should have known better. So <laughs> I want you to be thinking every time that a dog is doing something really, really well and handling a challenge really appropriately, you can end that challenge, that repetition, give them a little break. I'm not saying like, put them down or like send them home. But even if it's just a matter of putting that foot down and going back to brushing an ear, right? Going back to something that they thought was fine. You've got four feet, work on them at different times, right? You can, you can pace yourself and do multiple repetitions. But if you start making repetitions of when you're calm, I release. When you're calm, I release. Now, I will give you another example because I think that it's really common, especially with something like poodle feet, a dog that is bouncing up against us while we're trying to, to clipper is actually hitting themselves with the edge of the clipper, right? We're, we may be thinking this doesn't hurt, it's just hair. But every time that they bounce into our clipper like that, they are hurting themselves. I mean, I wouldn't want a clipper blade banging up against my toe. And hopefully... If, if I were kicking a clipper blade, someone would like bring it to my attention like, um, hey, you, if you stop kicking it, it won't hurt, <laughs> which is kind of what we need to do with these dogs, right? So every time they're holding still and they're not kicking it and we back off again, they start thinking, oh, oh, hey, funny thing. It doesn't hurt if I don't kick it. <laughs> so again, we're always thinking about safety. We want these dogs to be safe. We want them to think that this is pleasant. So sometimes restoring pleasant, right? Ending the, the challenge, the thing that they thought was difficult and ending it is negative reinforcement. We're removing the challenge, restoring pleasant. And I know there are a lot of trainers that are going to be like, oh, I don't know if I can be on board with negative reinforcement. But it, we're not applying grooming to be mean, we're applying grooming because grooming processes are important for dog's health. We're applying veterinary processes because they're important for a dog's health. So if we think in terms of these are things that a dog needs to know, and some of the things that a dog needs to know are things that they're not going to think are pleasant. So we can work on it in a way that makes them realize that we are not doing it to be mean, <laughs> that it's safe to let us do unpleasant things to you. And I know a lot of dog trainers and a lot of owners find that a little bit, um, a little bit shocking. They're like, oh, I don't want to do unpleasant things to my dog. But bear with me, because a dog with an ear infection that needs ear medication, that's unpleasant, but it is also in their best interest, and it's our responsibility as owners to do that. It's our vet's responsibility as a vet to make sure that we can give them medications. It's trainer's responsibility to make sure that we can do these things, for groomers to do these things. This is all part of providing health care for a living being who doesn't understand what's best for them. So we can work with um, rewards in a variety of ways. Like I said, we have food rewards, we have toys, and we also have this ability to give them a break and restore pleasant. So I know that was a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> but this week's action step, our weekly action step, is to think about all of the different types of rewards we can use. I would love for you guys to write up a list and just have some ideas in your mind, even if it means thinking about like the dogs you have that are particularly difficult. Um, but write a list and keep it someplace like in your grooming shop or in your vet office and be thinking about what are some of the rewards I can give? What, what do I have available to me? Make, put it someplace, post it someplace so that you're seeing it all the time. Like, ah, oh, that's right. It's not just about cookies. 
Like I have a number of ways that I can tell this dog, you have just earned something pleasant, I've added a reward marker, and now you get something pleasant, which could be a break. <laughs> um, so everybody have a great week and stay curious. If you'd like to talk to me, you can find me through my grooming and training business, happycrittersdogtraining.com, my email, chrissy at happycritters.net, and through the Creating Great Grooming Dogs Facebook page. And we have these awesome devices in our pockets that allow us to do live video with each other. I can help you with the dog on your table. We can set up live lessons, and you may be surprised at how much we can get accomplished together via video.